Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final uh, West Cork Literary Festival event of uh, 2020. It's certainly been a very unusual year, but we're delighted to have been able to bring you events online. Um, our final event tonight is um, an event for Winter Papers 6, um, where uh, one of the editors of Winter Papers, Kevin Barry, is going to be in conversation with three of the contributors, Una Mannion, John Patrick McHugh, and Una Montague. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to those in a moment, but I, first of all, I'd like to take an opportunity to thank all four of our speakers tonight and also uh, you guys, our audience, and also our funders, the Arts Council of Ireland, Cork County Council, and their uh, Library and Arts Services, Fulcher Ireland, and the Creative Europe Programme of the uh, European Union. So thank you to all of them for making, for making this um, event and the other events we've had this year possible, and I'm now going to hand you over to Kevin. Una, um, John and Una. Enjoy the event. Thanks very much, Emer. And this is an extremely special seasonal presentation uh, from all, all over the country, really. There, there's two of us in, in County Sligo, myself, Kevin Barry, and Una Mannion is up the road for me looking for that mythical County Sligo internet connection, um, hanging off a cliff in Strand Hill, I believe, at the moment. Um, we have Una Montague, down in uh, beloved Cork City in St. Luke's Cross, I believe, right now. And John Patrick McHugh is in Galway City as, as we speak. Um, thanks so much, Emer, for, for having us. It's usually, of course, um, in sun-kissed Bantry that, that the West Cork uh, Festival occurs every year. I, I've been myself seven or eight times now, I think. Um, and it's always piss and rain, of course, except last year, 2019, it was like, it was like Greece. Uh, for the three days we were down there. And so so forever now, my memories of the West Cork Festival are just sun and we're all jumping into the bay and, and all of that kind of thing. So hopefully we'll be back next year and, and everything will be right again after this kind of strange, bad, awful disaster movie of a year uh, we've been going through. Um, the only, the only good thing actually about, about this year has been everyone is buying stuff online. So the great news is we're, we're completely sold out um, of Winter Paper 6. It's been just flying out the gap. Um, I think there's an odd copy in, in, in stores around, maybe some Eason's might still have some. And uh, the distribution department, also known as Olivia Smith, my co-editor upstairs, uh, might have a few copies back on returns in, in the new year if you just email through the website. Um, I'm delighted to have you guys with us today just to talk about some of your pieces and some of the other pieces in, in Winter Papers 6. Um, we said before we have, we have two Unas, so it's, it's going to be... In the in the style of your old school teacher, I'd be using surnames occasionally here today. I think uh, we'll talk to each of you about your piece, and then we'll, we'll pick other kind of highlights uh, from the edition. Um, Una Montague in, in Cork. We'll go to you first, Una. Um, it was great, great, great to have you uh, making making your appearance this year um, in Winter Papers with a, a really, really beautiful and affecting um, story called "The Eye of a Storm." Um, let's let's talk about the story in a moment, but you're going to give us maybe a very a very quick reading from it. Yes, I will do. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. The sun was an angry thing, prickling hard at the edges of the shade. Under the wisteria, Sarah sat with her book. A storm was coming. The grown-ups in the village had been saying so for days. In front of her, beyond the wilting grass where the cicadas were screaming, Kiki played in a blue paddling pool. Being in the sun was Kiki's choice, inasmuch as he had choices. He had not wanted his pool to be pulled into the shade, screeching at every hand that tried. Now, this far into the summer, his seven-year-old skin was a burnished hide, supple, dark, beautiful. Sarah envied him that. You're a bitch. I'm a bitch. Kiki's real name was Philip. His mother had German measles while she carried him, and Kiki had arrived into the world blind and deaf, with a face turned ever upwards. Every summer, Kiki's father would come to visit Sarah's parents, bringing Kiki with him. Sarah liked it when they were there. Not because of Kiki who ignored Sarah, but because his father's presence changed things. A small, sandy-haired man with strong arms, he liked to play cards and drink wine and tease Sarah's parents late into the night, leaving them too distracted to fight with each other. Sarah enjoyed the peace of those evenings, lying in bed in the room she shared with Kiki, getting drowsy to the sound of laughter and the clink of wine glasses, except last night, and Kiki's father had unexpectedly gone to bed early with a headache and Sarah's parents had started again. You're a nasty piece of work. I'm a nasty piece of work. Kiki shrieked. Sarah breathed in deeply, trying to ignore the sound. Kiki liked to shriek when he was in the paddling pool. 
The sound echoed back from the walls of the garden, though he couldn't hear it. The only thing he could hear was a grinding of his teeth. So when he wasn't shrieking, he ground. The noises he made flicked at Sarah's skin like the elastic bands boys in school sometimes aimed at her bare ha arms. He smiled as he screeched, lifting his arms high so that he looked like a ballet dancer in his paddling pool. Kiki was beautiful. Sarah wondered a lot about the point of his being beautiful when he couldn't see himself. Sarah wasn't beautiful. Over the last year in school, the girls had grown taller, rounder, their hair and laughter spilling around them and Sarah had been left behind. She was all angles, sharp corners, bitten nails. They talked about boys they liked and complained about monthly cramps and Sarah pretended to find it all exciting. She had cramps too. Someday she could barely sit still on the school bus so much her belly ached, but it wasn't the right pain, just the fact of going home. You're nothing but a shit. I'm nothing but a shit. Last night, when she had heard Kiki's father say he needed an early night, Sarah had climbed back out of her bed to come to her usual spot, sitting cross-legged on the tiles beside the keyhole. Behind her, she could hear Kiki's steady breathing. She had wondered again if Kiki knew she was there, that they shared a room, that Sarah even existed. He had never used his fingers to trace her features like blind people did in movies. Sarah always hoped he might. She sometimes thought Kiki deliberately tried to avoid her, that he skirted her presence in a room. He was like the grown-ups that way. She had decided to be okay with it. It was easier to be left alone. It was quieter than being needed. Thanks so much, Una. It's a, it's a really beautiful, really affecting story. Um, I always think something that's really difficult to get to get right um, in fiction is the is the perspective from 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 childhood. Or I guess I guess Sarah is kind of in in early adolescence um, in it, but really she's coming to us from from kind of a childhood place. Um, the, 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 the note or the kind of tone or the tune of the story, did it come to you very naturally? Uh, was, it, was it a story that came quickly or was it lots of drafts and hard work? It was a story that wouldn't leave me alone, to be honest. It just wouldn't yeah. leave me alone. And there's bits that are taken, like, like so many of us, bits taken from my past, like these shadows that you keep going, fuck off, go away. I don't want to write about this. And they just mm. keep coming. So eventually... It almost feels self-indulgent. I know, John Patrick, you've written about things that mean a lot to as of you, Una, and it, it's, it almost feels self-indulgent, but you, can, you have to get them out of the way because they just keep coming out. So a lot of the story came really easily, the kind of summing it up to try and hit that chime, that bell when you know you've told it properly, that took a while to kind of yeah. finish it properly. And it's, it's interesting, isn't it, from, from, from what you're talking about there, like the more uncomfortable the subject is and the more uncomfortable the story often that's that's the one that will will give you the bigger rewards i mean people have an idea about inspiration being a kind of a lovely fluffy thing you know and very often it's not that at all it's kind of an annoyance and it's kind of a an uncomfortable feeling and the only way to get this out is to is to kind of is is, is to write it out um it, it, it like the, the setting is is is, is kind of it's kept kind of deliberately vague, I guess, but it's, it's, it's somehow very resonant as well. Uh, were you thinking about a very particular place when you... when you? Yeah, a very particular place that had a very strong effect on the physicality of everybody there. And that bit before a storm in this place is a bit mm. like, you know, the bit when before a tidal wave, when it sucks back, that yeah. weird Neverland waiting place. It was very, very strong sense of space then, just before the storm. It's very different when the storm would hit. Yeah. And like, I guess, I mean, the, one of the things the story is about really in a, in a way is how children and, and very young people sometimes kind of have to have to invent a world around them. Um, but what's going on at the edges of the story is this, is this marriage that's in kind of strife and is, and, and is, is in great difficulty, obviously. Um, so is it, so is it, were both of those elements always there with the story and were the characters always kind of clarified? They, they were, they were always clarified. I liked, there was, it's, you've summed it up very well. There's a real juxtaposition often with kids in a home that's fractious where you're living two separate worlds and the people who are meant to be in charge and running the world, they are, but the kids seem to actually be the backbone and they're holding everything up. And even Kiki, who's like blind and deaf and mute and you know he, he can't communicate in any way, he still managed to bring a sense of peace to a place where the fact that he did just simply by needing something from Sarah in the story was amazing. By seeing her when nobody else could see her, even though he could see or hear nothing. That yeah, was I, I think uh, yeah, yeah, Kiki is 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 kind of um, very skillfully handled. I think 
because you know by by the nature of the character he's he's not going to be doing much as such he's just got he has to be this kind of presence in the story that kind of grounds it in some kind of strange way i think as well have, have you been writing mainly stories um una or what, what have you been up to generally on on, on your writing desk um it's stories it's it's stories fragments short stories bits of flash that just keep they keep on popping up much it's like trying to keep a jack-in-the-box down i was talking to john patrick saying i'm like i'm a working single parent of two so i have no time for writing so it hmm. seems to sort of pop out the sides yeah, it's just, you just can't keep it down. So there are stories popping out. Yeah, and 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 have you found like is it is it is it sort of at night or in, early in the morning that you might sort of scrape some time to 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 get to the desk or? And the deadlines actually work well. I'm part of yeah. a lovely writing group, and they'll set deadlines. And often I do my best working when I'm meeting them at seven. I'll sit down at quarter past six and go, God, yeah. God, 45 minutes. That's all I have. The kids are all locked out of the room and I'll hammer out something then. And I have found that oddly through lockdown, that has become a pattern that actually works. Whereas if I take a week off, which I've done every now and then and go, I'm going to write for a week. I freeze. And go, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm going to watch reruns on television. Instead. I know that there, there, there's like, there's an awful lot to be, to be said for a deadline, really just, and it takes some of the kind of preciousness out of it. You know, you can always write, you know, um, to some standard or to some degree. It's just, you can be like, in, in some ways, um, you know, I, I, I have kind of an opposite circumstance. I've, I've sort of no children to be dealing with. I have no, no other job apart from going to my shed. And I, I could spend that, you know, 10 hours a day out there writing stories. And that doesn't make it any easier at all, you know. And so so at a, the, the whip of a deadline sometimes can be, can be a great thing. Um, I do have that strange thing. I don't know if others feel about it. We, 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 we thought we're where you can sit there for a long time and nothing comes and you say, I'll knock off in 10 minutes time. And that last 10 minutes, it can be just some prompt that 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 comes. Um, are, are, are you working towards putting a collection together? Maybe, Una, is that the is that the idea? Yeah, that's that's the plan. Actually, not meaning to blow smoke up your arse or anything like that. But I find that good reading something that stays with you will have an effect. And that will often pop more writing out. Like when I was reading Night Boat to Tangiers, which I read in the middle of lockdown, quite often like lines with that would be what would send me upstairs going there's a pattern emerging in my head from having listened to the lads voices in that yeah. book and um, good good re good reading of other people's writing can often kick start the process yeah yes oh, and, and that's great to hear thanks very much like i i i I've, I've the same as well i do find as well you you have to be careful with with people who kind of um the right writers of great writers that you read when I remember like being obsessed with kind of Saul Bellow and, and Philip Roth and all in my 20s when I was in Cork and all the great American Jews you know and, and it, it kind of held me back as much as prodded me on because I was trying to be a the great American Jewish uh, <laughs> writer down in down in places like St. Luke's Cross and it, it wasn't working out very well you know but um, we, we, we'll come back to you in a bit Una thank, thank, thanks so much um, we're, we're, we're going to slip into the non-fictional world um, with John Patrick McHugh and, and John, this was your first time, I think, slipping into the non-fictional world yourself in, in, yeah. for, for any length of a piece. Yeah, I um, never kind of had interest or an itch before. So yeah, it was the first time I thought to have a go at one. Yeah, brilliant. And it, it, it's, a, it's a really, really uh, moving and, and a really, really strong essay called Death and the Family. Uh, will, will you give us a blast from it, John? And we'll, we'll talk about it then. No problem. Within the space of a year, my cousin died and then the granddad. They're at the extreme ends of things as deaths go. Granddad was 91 and his mind was smashed in by Alzheimer's. While David was 18 and had recently sat the leaving and was all set for college. In terms of the act of dying, there are opposites too. One death was protracted, fiercely draining, and in the end, the relief when it arrived. The other was abrupt as a head meeting a piano in the other room. I was at the laptop when dad shouted up that David had had a heart attack. My first instinct was the wrong one. I assumed he was referring to our David and Ackle, my older cousin. Still a shock, still shocking, but the David and Ackle was in his thirties, a hardy farmer, a sleaze rolled to the elbow buck. It was conceivable that his heart might suddenly give out. I pictured this David in the midst of a heart attack, his pool table frame sprawled over the wheel of a tractor in a sodden field, grazing sheep fanning out for him but even in this first feverish dreaming David was never dead. Altogether shook at his home 
or possibly wired up in the hospital, but not dead. People you know and love never die. Downstairs, I trail behind dad as he threw on a coat and fished for his keys in the bowl while relaying the necessary and unnecessary instructions in a perfectly calm and composed manner. Look in after granny and granddad, talk to your sister, put out the dogs in a while. I nodded along, not fully processing, and when he was out the door, his puffy coat on, the keys held in a fist, I thought to ask after man. He said she was at the hospital. He was meeting her there. Already, I said, in Castle Bar. He answered, it's not that, David. After the car pulled off, I phoned my sister. I hugged Granny. I checked on Granddad. I sent a flurry of messages and then silenced my phone. I stomped about the house and then I decided I should make a lasagna. An activity which carried me along for an hour. And as I teetered over my excessively cheese creation, the dread building in my stomach once more, that I received a call from Dad. His voice was seemingly normal, but the reception was patchy, so I moved outside. He asked how next door was, how I was doing, if sister had arrived over yet. And I inquired about how he was, how mam was, and we both pointedly avoided what the call was truly about. In the trees, the leaves were see-through like shredded plastic. The dogs were sniffling behind me. The grass was cool and wet beneath my naked feet. I'd better go, he said. And so finally I asked, how is David now? There is sunshine too, I recall. A lazy breeze, the rustle and whistle of overgrown hedges, birds, prickly weeds gleaming throughout the garden as if dusted in silver and gold. Lovely day, really. Oh, Dad said after a moment. Oh, John, he's dead. Thanks, John. It's it's a it's a really uh, really powerful piece, and a lot a lot of people have have remarked to us um, on it already, and I'm sure lots more will be reading it um, over 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 the holiday. Um, as, as John, as a writer who who works uh, as you do more often than not in in short fiction form, uh, when you went through these these events in life. Um, you know, it's, it's always material. That's, that's one of the things the writer is always thinking. Were you thinking in the first instance, do I deal with this in a short story? Um, is this material that could come into a short story or, or did, it, did it lead you naturally enough in, into a kind of a nonfiction mode? Yeah, um, it was. It is always material. I remember when it was happening, I was thinking, well, one day I will write about this. Mm. Um, I think if it was, this is a horrible way to, to think, but these two deaths are one in my head completely. Yeah. But if it was just granddad, it probably would bleed into a, a fiction story. But David's passing was so abrupt and so shocking that fiction just wouldn't wouldn't carry off that emotion. Um, so I remember when, was, when these events were happening, I was thinking along, OK, I will write about this one day. But again, mm. I, I was almost I was very f fearful of writing it. And it was only the prompt to come to write an essay that I finally kind of stood up and said, I'll have a go. And a part of that as well as I, I remember reading um, E. Mulaney's fabulous book, uh, Minor Monuments, mm -hmm. and he talks about his grandfather's Alzheimer's yeah. in such a beautiful way, but also like technically and just he, he does it all. I remember emailing him and just saying, I, f I feel like I don't have to write about my granddad now uh, because he's done it for me. And I, that really opened the door for me, allowed me to kind of write this essay um, and kind of skip over the parts that I was just like, well, Ian's done that and he's done it brilliantly. I don't want to touch it again. Yeah, it, well, I guess one of the great um, advantages of the essay or the nonfiction form is that there's an immediacy that, that, that fiction doesn't lend itself to fiction. You know, the stuff has to sit in your subconscious for for years before you're 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 kind of bitter enough to, to write a short story about it. Whereas whereas you can go straight in with an essay. I find personally, I find essays like really hard work uh, compared to a short story work. It's going well. You can get a sense of flow going, and, and you're you're having fun with it. But essays have never felt fun with me. But but you feel good when you finish one. Uh, did did it work in any kind of cathartic way on you, John? When you when you got through the essay? Yeah, it, like I suppose in, in kind of almost two ways. Like I wrote this during the, the first lockdown. I couldn't write fiction. Um, it just feel it felt quite meaningless or something like that. It was going through my head, and too much was gone. So no, in that way, I could actually write because I was just doing something. You know, I knew the answers, if that makes sense. Um, I still had to kind of figure out how they all fit together, but I knew what happened. So in that way, it was very moving. 
and very like helpful for myself. And I did like it, it was I've never been a crier, but I remember writing a couple of paragraphs where like tears were just coming down um, my face while writing without my without knowing it. So it was very helpful in that way. And it was funny because I'm kind of the same in that a short story. When I get into that flow, it's, you know, it's the most beautiful thing. But short stories take me about two years to write. Whereas, you know, this essay I wrote in about two months, yeah. but the actual getting a sentence right for this essay was so hard. Yeah. Does that make sense? I just, because yeah. the way I phrase things is so different. It's not nonfiction. So getting it to actually read well was such a big uh, problem. But the actual process was so much quicker than a short story would be. Yeah. Uh, something, something we, we talk to you about when you when you send into stories. Or, I mean, I, I mean, this comes around to the fact that, like, I think very often in, in any kind of writer's career, early on, there's this kind of circular motion where you're you're kind of just about you're kind of hovering around your fundamental stuff, your fundamental material, which often comes from family life and things like this. And you can have it can take years to develop a, a thick enough skin to kind of go in there and really tackle it. You you jumped straight in. And we did ask you when you when you submitted the piece, how how how's the family with it? You know, what you been writing directly about very painful, quite recent events. So you kind of broached it with them, did you? A, a, a little and 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 see where they comfortable with it. Oh yeah, yeah. I I I I talked to my dad about it throughout, and I kind of gave hints and stuff like that. Because I was at home during the first lockdown. I got caught here between here and Dublin, um, and since then my family have all read it and they all appreciate it, and I suppose they appreciate what I was trying to do. Um, because that was like, yeah, it, it, it's such a big worry because, and it's something that the essay kind of addresses. I didn't want to profit from tragedy, you know. I, I wanted yeah, to yeah. kind of make something more than the tragedy to kind of get at something for myself as much as detail these kind of two deaths. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's 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 such a careful line, and I, my dad did ask me to remove like I think two lines. Right. I did. Do, I did do that. Um, yeah. You know, it's not worth. I, it. I, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a good kind of ex exercise in etiquette, really, isn't it? Just to, just to, to tell yourself as a nonfiction writer. I mean, you, you, as a fiction writer, you, you could kind of get away with any, get away with lots, really, you know. But when you're when you're when you're dealing with it in a nonfictional way, you really have this kind of extra responsibility, which can be very, very, very daunting. Um, but you know, I, I think you, you will get away with it because it's, it's patently a very serious piece of work. And what I think comes across very strongly in it is. Um, that kind of the strangeness of, of of grief when you encounter it first in adulthood very different thing as, as a kid if, if a grandparent or, or or whatever dies but when in adulthood the kind of the cold kind of everyday sense of it where, to, where things just keep ticking along and you're making the lasagna and you're dealing with the whole rituals of, of funerals and, and and all of that stuff um that comes across very very, very strongly um in in the piece um was it quite like the events are quite fresh so that texture was all there available when you when you sat down to write it yeah i i, I kind of like a strange it, it it felt like it was only last week in some regards to when i kind of thought back you know when i and then i coming to the end i actually started dating things to figure out where they're all placed and you know they're miles apart but they f feel like they're all so tight together so yeah a lot of a lot of those details are still fresh and obviously i was writing it in the same house where um, my granddad spent his last couple of years struggling with uh, dementia and whatnot. So again, I went into the living room and I, I saw these kind of, you know, the pictures that he had of that he had of David down beside him um, in the days after David's funeral and stuff like that. So it was all it was all there. But it's just funny when I think about the time, it, it's all like a, a almost like last week. And I suppose that is a difference when you get older. I remember being a, a child and a dog's death was the same for me as my grandfather dying. Yeah. Like I was just heartbroken over both of them. Whereas yeah. with David and Grant, that it just lingers. And you, you know, you get that feeling sometimes that they're almost still alive, you know, and then it kind of hits you again for the, like the, the next time, especially with David, because he was so young and yeah. a beautiful young boy. And it's kind of, I think, I don't know whether it's it's a, a particular thing on, on on this island, but we, we, we kind of, we don't talk very much about our, our, our experiences of grief here, I think. Um, we, we kind of, we kind of swallow it all down and kind of stumble along. So, so, so an awful lot of the stuff, even in our own minds, isn't really articulated. Um, but, but John, two years to write a short story, and you, you, you've managed to get a collection of them together. So, so a lot, long time to make it. It's coming very soon, John. I think, isn't it in, in the new year? Yeah, February, February time. I think eighteenth or twenty fifth. One of those. Give, give us the yeah. title. Give us the title. 
pure gold pure gold I, I, so i love that i love that you've <laughs> called your first collection pure gold man that's a that that's a that's 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 a that's a that's a that's a move i tell you, you gotta go for it you just have <laughs> to go <laughs> for it <laughs> uh, but um, we can't wait for it and it's called it's called pure gold and it's it's February, is that what you said? February, yeah, yeah. Brilliant, fantastic. We'll, we'll come back to you in a, in, in a bit, Sean. Um, Una Mannion, uh, to use my schoolmaster's voice, we move along to it, the other the other Una. Um, a fantastic uh, story, um, a false crawl. Uh, you, we'll talk about it in a moment, Una. You might, you, you might give us a, a, a short reading from it. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a, a bit from the very beginning and a little bit from the middle. A vehicle vagrancy ticket arrives in the mail for our Toyota Corolla. It's from a parking lot in Dayton, Ohio. She still hasn't registered the car in her name. We've been receiving citations, which I keep hidden from my husband. He didn't want to give it to her in the first place. She's already a car wreck, he said. Why would we put her behind the wheel of ours? I call her number over and over. I send text messages, emails. When she finally calls me, she's vague about the registration, thought she'd done it. She tells me not to worry, that if one were to sleep in a car, one would do it in truck stops or Walmart parking lots, where there are always others, others sleeping in vehicles. Plus, and this has nothing to do with her, but it's important to know, in most states, it's not against the law to live in your car. She knows a lot about sleeping in cars. I wonder, does she even have a license? And if she has an accident, will we get sued? Register the goddamn car, Gina. I text her, all caps. I told my husband all the paperwork was finished. I looked up living in cars and find nearly a million Americans are doing it. And as it turns out, Walmart does allow people to sleep in their parking lots overnight. So do Cracker Barrel and Home Depot. My youngest daughter is learning about the Vikings, Marco Polo and Columbus. Her teacher says that explorers are people who venture into the unknown. My daughter puts up her hand and tells the class that her mother's best friend is an explorer called Gina. That's one word for it, my, says my husband. My daughter tells me that one of the boys shouted, there are no girl explorers. I tell her that's exactly what Gina is and consider my daughter's tilted angle on the world, an explorer, not drifting, but discovering. The summer after I finished college, I said I was going on a camping trip with Gina. I was pregnant and she was the only person in the world I told. We'll go to a place out of state where we won't see anyone we know, she said. She organized everything. When it was over, she was there waiting for me. That weekend, we saw the loggerheads lay their eggs. We waited for the turtles, crouching downwind in the dark on the white dunes. She told me that the loggerheads came back to nest in the exact place where they were born. After more than 30 or even 50 years and thousands and thousands of miles, they returned to that very first place. We stopped talking when we saw the first one struggling up the beach towards us. She came near, started to dig, but stopped suddenly. She turned, abandoning the effort and trudged her way back to the sea, all her eggs still inside her. It's called a false crawl, Gina whispered. They changed their minds, nobody knows why. They can't nest and they return to the sea without laying anything. Wonderful, thanks, Una. Um, just a first question, is, is it true that you're allowed sleep in your car? In, in the parking lots of Cracker Barrels and Walmarts. Is it, is yeah. it that's actually true? Okay, that's, that's true. very, very useful information. <laughs> if any of us should ever find ourselves in a tight spot, uh, I may need to do that. Um, the character Gina re really leaps off the page, Una. She, she's really strongly realized. She's a uh, kind of willful and idiosyncratic. And for the narrator, I guess she, she she's, she's represents the life not lived. Uh, and, and, and the kind of wilder path not taken. Um, was, was she the starting point to the story for you? Or, or was she with you for a while before you, before you began to write the piece? Uh, definitely. I, and it, interestingly, I think when I first started to write the Gina character, I had a little bit of anger towards Gina that shifted to the, to the husband, mm. um, the narrator's anger. So initially she's angry with her, with her friend for like, I suppose, messing up over and over again. And for and, and and I think the more I was in it, in the story, the more I saw that in many ways, Gina is is doing what men 
do, can do, you know, and have the adventure quest and and hit out and light west and and have agency and discover. And I think a little bit of the narrator um, was was jealous of that and judged it. And I think as I as I got more and more into the story, I think she be she began to see something else in the part of herself that she had lost. Yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. Interesting. I mean, I described the character Gina as willful and idiosyncratic, but it, if it had been a guy uh, doing these things, it wouldn't be considered in, in that way at all, which really comes true. Uh, again, like 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 the other Una's uh, a story, um, it's about the character Gina and what they've gone through together in, 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 their, in their youth, but it's also uh, a portrait of this marriage, isn't it? And, and the way it's kind of, it's fraying a little, at least uh, at the edges. It struck me reading it, um, that, 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 that there's the bones of a longer story in here uh, as well. Did, did this feel like one as you were writing it that was always going to be a short story or did you think this could sort of expand? What I found is that I had to cut and I did, I mean, I suppose because because the time, uh, the time span, um, there's a lot going back to childhood and times where they ran away. And I suppose these became, these scenes became unwieldy in, the, in that, I, you know, to come in, with the reasonable word count to you, uh, I needed to start to start editing back. I ha- I mean, it was it was definitely conceived as a short story, and I'm I'm not sure I get away with there's certain things. I I was trying to use a kind of continuous present voice, you know, even though it's over a period of time. I I don't know why, but it just kept being said in as as if it were happening in this thing over and over again, and. I don't know if I felt a certain urgency or if, why that happened. And I tried to put it in simple past and it just lost yeah. something. Yeah. Um, so that I, I, I'm, I, I can't, it wasn't so much a conscious decision as something that happened. Yeah, no, the, the story in, 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 in the form that you chose for it and the way you structured it, it does have a kind of a headlong momentum, I think, uh, which wouldn't be there if, if you went with that simple simple past maybe um is it stories that you're working on primarily at the moment una we know you have, you have a novel coming very soon um a crooked next three month. is coming in next January. month yeah are, are, are your nerves at you <laughs> <laughs> i'm demented i know yeah it's it's it's, it's it is actually we, we're not warned enough it's a horrendous feeling isn't it with, yeah. with, with the first book coming out. Sorry, John Patrick, you want to follow it. But it's, yeah. from, don't look at Goodreads. And then every day I'm like, will I look at Goodreads? You know, and <laughs> here are some, see the terrible things or the kind thing. So, I mean, you know, and I, I guess there will be, I mean, maybe no one will review it, but then, you know, you're just sort of like waiting in trepidation. But yeah, I, today, in fact, Harper Collins, um, Books arrived in the post today, and I'm still waiting for papers. But yeah, it's all. Oh, that's, that's a lovely moment. Con- 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 congratulations! I'm sure. I'm sure it'll do marvelously. Um, Thank I'm you. Sure and I'm, I'm mo- I am working on another novel at the moment. Um, so yeah. that's that's. Um, yeah also has me deranged i know i know this is this is this is the joy of it all you're based in county sligo for for a while now how long how long have you been in the northwest Um, almost 30 years so Hmm. since i I moved back permanently in 92 but i've been kind of i I used i've been coming since the late 80s i suppose and i've been in NUI galway in the mid 80s and just i my father's from sligo and so all my cousins and my aunts and uncles are here so i kept i came all my life Hmm. I mean, spent my summers here, but I found it hard to leave. You know, yeah. so the, the, does the does the setting uh, for your fiction? I know the novel is set in the US as well. Um, does it vary? Where you, did, did, are you inclined to set your work primarily in the US, or does it happen with Irish locales as well? Or I, it happens in I, I've set in both, um, but probably more in the states. And I think I think that might have something to do with being away from it. Uh, you know, and maybe because it's my first place and, and that inevitably, you know, you're going to write your first place at, at some point, but, um, but I think maybe um, not being there and somehow I, I find it easier to write. And there's a little bit of me that sometimes is nervous to, to delve into the Irish 
yeah. I, I suppose sensibility because of just that fear of like, who do you think you are? <laughs> Blow in, you know. I, I in Stranto, like my aunt lives up the road. She's 87, yeah. and there's another woman who is who's been here for like 65 years, and she'd always be like, Patricia's not from here, you know. So you're, I know, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> I, it's such it's such a peculiar thing in Ireland that the the, the idea of the blow in, like, you could literally be from a mile and a half down the road and you're considered foreign, you know? Yeah. But, it's, but it's strange that distance that's sometimes necessary as well. Like I, I lived in Cork City for a decade and I never wrote a word about it while I was there. It was just too kind of, now I can't stop writing about it. You know? <laughs> uh, and it, it, it can take that that time for it all to, to filter in and, and, and settle. Um, we, we, we'll come back to you in, in, in a little while. Una. I think I'm looking at the clock and we're kind of, we're, 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 we're moving on. So I, I, I'm going to ask, ask each of you to, to pick another piece that you read in, in uh, this this year's edition of of Winter Papers and just just talk about it a little. Uh, so Una Montague. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I I had there's so many pieces I wanted to pick from, and Una Mannion had picked one piece that I love as well that you're going to talk about. So I was going to talk about Louise Kennedy's in bulk. I just I loved it. For a start, it made me Google the word in bulk because I didn't know what it meant. And then when I Googled, it was a lovely thing of Googling it after the story and going, oh, it works even better. It's a really good title. Mm. Um, I just find she writes the woman's experience really well herself and Elaine, the one that you were going to talk about, Una, they both share the fact that they write so well about the mundanity and the loving drudgery and boredom of being a mother and just how inane it can be but it's still imbued with love but Louise's story is it's really simple it's a really simple story and it's told in a way and you follow the arc and then at the end in bulk is is in it's the I think is it the first or second of February it's, it's the first, first February of, I think yeah. yeah first signs of spring so but but as we know the first signs of spring are usually often come with a punch in the face of winter right behind them and that's what she does with the story there's this moment where you think things aren't going well with herself and her husband it's all it's looking very it's looking bleak and then all of a sudden there's a little bit of hope and you go oh it's gonna be okay and then she punches you right in the face and ends the book and you just uh, ends the story and I what I said to Louise online was I said it had me staring out the window just feeling quite sad for a while which is like a sign of a really good story I really really enjoyed that yeah it's it's, it's fantastic um and there there is that the, the sometimes a, a title just adds so much doesn't it um, and, and that that title in bulk, I, I, I vaguely knew that it meant spring, um, that it was the, the old Irish pagan festival of spring. But it's um, it, it it just gives a, a sense, a kind of of of, of a texture and atmosphere to the story about about we all know that time of the year where, where you're trying to convince yourself against all reality that we're we're into the new season and it's just there. But it's um, yeah, there, there's lots of gloriously happy marriages depicted in winter papers this year is another one of them <laughs> in Louise's yeah. stories so all, all good um john patrick what, what, what did you what did you go for yeah there was so many good stuff but the one that kind of stuck out me even his title alone uh, straight out of mullingar the conversation between nicole flattery and neve algar and i just love this just even just the idea of these two superstars of these creative fields sitting in a back garden with the good biscuits between them, chatting. Um, it's such a warm conversation. I always love these kind of interviews where there's no product to be sold. It's just two people who respect each other, respect the craft, the craft just chatting. I just love that it. it's such a warm um, conversation. And there's such little details. I, was, I kind of grew up in small towns in Cork till I was about 12. And I loved how they touched upon the boredom of living in these small towns when you're a kid and you have to reach out for cultural impulses that you don't necessarily understand. And I love the respect they give. I think Nicole's term, this movie that kind of changed her life is This Is Spinal Tap. Yeah. And I, I, just, I just love that idea because I, I remember dad putting on um, Knowing Me, Knowing You with Alan Partridge. And that like, it's such, it was, I was like 12, 13. And suddenly I got a deeper level of humor that I hadn't encountered before. And it's just, it's just a really warm conversation between two people with some like, quietly quietly intelligent yeah. uh, pronunciations about art and, and craft and the idea of fun of like yeah. always kind of keeping fun in work which is i think is so important too yeah i i think it's it's very interesting what you what you mentioned there about the kind of the, the kind of sheer dreariness of growing up sometimes in irish towns and and in small irish cities and you know i i, I sometimes get asked in interviews why why is ireland so many 
great writers and, and, and so forth. And I said, because, you know, it's an extraordinarily dreary place for about 11 and a half months of the year, you know, yeah. there's, there's nothing going on out there. So we need, we need to make stuff up and we, we need to invent and stuff. But it's, no, it's, it's, it's one of our favorite things in, in winter papers is to bring, um, is to bring artists and uh, from from different from different fields and crafts together to talk about how, how they go about things and it, it was it was really just an added uh, bonus with this piece that they, they kind of went to school together so that they, they had a, a lot of the kind of that shared history and sh- 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 way of seeing way of seeing the world um thanks john U- una you you picked out um so i chose elaine feeney's let me go mad in my yeah. own way um which again a uh, a lovely marriage described. <laughs> um, I, I loved this story and I think I, I had sort of the visceral reaction of, of Elaine Feeney's prose, which I mean, she's a poet and a crafts, a crafts person, mm. just sizzling electric prose. But this story sat with me for days after and I, I think it's profound. I, I think it's an extraordinary story and it's ostensibly about a breakup of a marriage um, but it's much, much more than that. And it's about a woman sort of excavating herself um, and particularly her her fear and her anger and her uncertainty. And I think it's an old story. I think it's a Jack Kerouac for women um, yeah. story. And, it, and the very first line is, I like driving alone. Mm. Um, and she likes driving in inappropriate shoes, shoes that you might put on, um, because you're in a rush, because you're impulsive, because you're a risk taker, you know, and and then we get the story of of the of the marriage, which is basically um, the woman is becoming smaller and smaller in her house. She has the child's room, the hallway, and the outhouse where the laundry room is, and he has like all the man space, you know, which is all the space. It's like all the outdoors, all the bedrooms, and he takes the family car when he le- when he leaves her, and. And then he also dictates the, the the arrangements of the child sharing, which would be she has the child whenever the child is sick and all weekdays, and he'll have the child on Sunday, provided he's well and the child's well. You know, and this you can feel the the rage surfacing as you're you know you're, and but the thing that 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 she describes is that women are always taught to you know the art of of hiding. Mm. that there's an artistry in like hiding your anger, hiding your rage, hiding your pain. And at the end of this, um, there's a section called um, losing it. And it's about um, losing it. But the thing is, is when she loses it, she, she, she knows that there's something in her, like when she's angry, it's real and she feels mm. in control. So the very last section is called truth. And she references um, this, this documentary that she's that she's seen, which is called I think it's called um, Free Solo, and it's about this rock climber who um, he's the greatest rock climber in the world, Alex yeah. Halland, I think his yeah, name is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should know Hanid, Hanid. but he 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 ascends the mountain with no ropes, and he gets to the top, and he neuroscientists are like you know where does the fearless, fearlessness come? So they actually did studies on him and looked at his amygdala, which is our like fear center in our mm-hmm. bodies. And they showed him things that should, images during a scan that should provoke it, stimulate it, and it was inert. It didn't react at all. And he talks about, it. he said, I am afraid. Of course mm-hmm. I'm afraid. I'm 3,000 3, feet above ground on a wall. But he said, but I've trained myself, I've tricked my amygdala by rehearsing it over and over and over again. Um, so that that I, I visualized it, I've done it with ropes. And because of that, I know how to suppress all that fear. And at the very end of the story, she's back in the car and, and I'm just gonna, can I read the last sure, just a yeah. few lines from the very end? Um, my amygdala can be tricked over and over, especially when I'm driving. Sometimes it's the end or drive heading west going nowhere. That's the thing with the inner machine of the brain. You can trick it over and over again, like the roads you coast down to get lost just for a while, just a little while. And it's, you know, it's about, it's like a field guide for getting lost or a field guide for losing it. You know, that idea of heading out into the unknown and uncertainty, risk taking, I loved it. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a glorious kind of howl of a story, isn't it? But I, I love your characterization of it as a, as a road story as well. I think that that's perfect. It's also very funny, you know. And and I I, I think that the, it's a comic engine that keeps you just heart heartling through through the story. Um, we're 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 kind of looking at the clock again. We're kind of at a time. Oh, just one one last question for 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 each of you. Uh, maybe uh, just just after after the, the 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 very odd year that we've all been through um have, like john you said you said a while ago the way you know it can be it can be hard to go back to your desk and look at a short story while all this stuff is going on it can seem like an insignificant thing to be doing but um do you feel uh we, we've come to, to to una una first una montague um like is there an effect on your writing from from what we've gone through or is it like too early to say um Oh, what, um, I, actually, I think it's probably the latter it's a too early to say it's a little mm. bit like uh, almost like the McDonald's of the restaurant world it's been such a huge thing that everybody's all gone through. I'm not saying we've all gone to McDonald's but we've all gone through it together that writing about it is almost too obvious right now mm. I can start to see the trickle down in the children smaller more subtle things but I think to be honest for me it brought a out a moment of stillness which kicked me into writing which I hadn't been doing so mm. it had in the midst of everything some very positive moments and for me it, it made everything so quiet mm. that I had no choice but to start writing yeah and for that I will be grateful although I don't want to have had the experience for everybody across the world at all yeah there, there, there was the sense strangely I think sometimes this year wasn't it that you could kind of hear yourself you know and and and, and you're not used to <laughs> To be able to hear yourself when there's so little going on, and when when the hours of the day are moving moving so slowly, um, John John Patrick. Yeah, I, I suppose it's too hard to say. I suppose the one thing I took from this year is um, how much like a, a little bit of community, like being able to meet people in the pub, not even to get drunk, but just to chat. Yeah. How much that informs my writing, and how much that gives me impetus to keep going. Um, because the quiet is beautiful, and I, I you know the first three four weeks I was like, wow, this is gonna be amazing, but you know, it'd be too quiet. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you need to you need to get some loudness in there. But um, yeah, so I suppose just give me a, a deeper appreciation of how important it is just to see people in chat and just even voice out loud things that you know that are kind of rooting around your your brain to kind of get yeah. more inspiration and more weight behind them. Yeah, it's strange. Like it, it only belatedly um, occurred to me probably only a few years ago, like how important it is for writers to get out of the house. Um, because if I, you know, if I just keep going to my shed every day and writing a story, I'm, I'm eventually going to be writing the story about the fellow in the shed writing a story, you know. <laughs> There's nothing else feeding, feeding the thing. So you have to go out and just, I, I find as well just eavesdropping and just listening to people. Yeah. I really miss that, you know, and, and watching people have fights in cafes and stuff. I love that, you know, and that's, that's such good feed all the time. Well, what about yourself, Una, um, this year? Yeah, I would echo Una and John Patrick in that I think that there's a gift in terms of the stillness and the like, you know, stopping for, you know, I think I was going sort of hell for leather for a long time, but I found it very difficult um, to write during, to be honest, I, I haven't been very productive or not productive in the ways I'd want to be. I had a lot of anxiety. Yeah. Um, just, I, I suppose, like, uh, worrying about people and a lot of my family in America and healthcare and mm lost a family member and just mm. I just I think um and and as Una mentioned even like just seeing like the impact on the kids and 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 thinking I was too strict and I should have been less strict and you know um so I I um it's been some year and yeah. um for so many people and you know I've been really lucky in so many ways to be in Ireland. I mean, my sibling, some of my siblings in the States are in apartment buildings with 10 stories. And yeah, it's very hard, very difficult. You, you yeah. have to step in an elevator to get up and down. You So, mm. um, and we have, we're so blessed with the outdoors. So, mm. I mean, I have no reason to complain, but, or at all, or, but I did find it, um, I wasn't, yeah. the, I wasn't productive, so. Yeah, I, I, I found it like, uh, I was doing stuff, but I, I just this week I was looking back at some stuff I wrote in, in April, and, uh, and and I was just filling pages. You know, I was just it was a completely just a displacement activity, so that I wasn't looking at breaking news kind of things. You know, I was just complete golf, nonsense, golf, golf like I thought it was all right at the time, but it's um, yeah. I think one of the things like for this year to filter into the work, what we haven't really 
got our hands on yet or got a got a got a real feeling for is how, is how deeply sorrowful you know a uh, time it's been we 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 can't really cope with that yet and i think that that'll come slowly um in in succeeding years um but it's, it's a slightly somber note to leave it on but it's it's been really lovely to to see you all um if not in a pub but there's next year for that hopefully um but but best of luck with, with all the work that's coming out um, thanks to Emer and everyone at the at the glorious West Cork Festival for having us. So thanks to Una Montague, John Patrick McHugh, and Una Mannion. Thanks so much. Hi. We do the little Zoom wave, <laughs> the, the sorrowful Zoom wave, you know. <laughs>